So you have Hans Baldung showing you that, yes, this woman is beautiful, young, but seen in her mirror is other symbols and behind her is death holding an hourglass above her head. And this would be easily understood by all of us. We would recognize this. Similarly, you have this, what is called a vanitas or a still light where everyone knows that a skull represents death and floating above the skull is a bubble. And this tells you it's called Homa Bulla, which is the bubble of man. And man's life is but a bubble, as transient as a bubble, bubble, and it'll burst any time. And of course, you have a flower which is going to wilt. It's plucked, it's kept in a vase, and the flowers are going to wilt. So these are straight symbols that anybody can identify, irrespective of which culture we come from. But then we move into something slightly more complex. And this is one of the paintings that's often spoken about. Jan van Eyck's portrait of what is very disputed as to the actual provenance of this painting, but we just know it is him definitely. We know the year he painted it is 1434. And this is considered one of the early great influential oil paintings. And what, if you look at the technique of this painting, this painting is done as oil on oil. So when the oil has still not completely dried, this person is painting another layer on it. So that gives it a certain richness. So that is technique. But if you look deeper into this painting, there's a lot, lot more. Uh, it's considered technically one of the great paintings. And if you can see how he's lit it, he's planned to show not only the foreground, but also the background. So he has light coming in through the window on the left, lighting up the rear, but he's also got a different light lighting up the foreground. So you can see the main characters in the middle ground very clearly. You can also see things in the foreground, a pair of shoes or clogs, uh, a kind of uh, pet dog, a little dog. It's called a Brussels Griffon and it's representative of fidelity and I'll come back to this. But you can also see a variety of things in the background. The whole setting is very rich. Uh, initially, people thought it was a bedroom, but now we realize that this is actually the room in which a woman would receive people. And this is often after her baby is born that the bed is in the reception room so people can sit on it. And a lot of uh, people used to conduct their uh, business from sitting on their bed. And behind you have an expensive couch. And we'll come to some of these symbols earlier. We also know the time of year because if you look through the open window, you see a cherry tree and you see the cherries on it. So you know approximately the time of the year. And that's what we are seeing a detail on the right side. You can see cherries on the branch uh, outside the tree. He's very cleverly shown that this is spring. Now spring is March and April. And April gets its name from the etymology of April is aparir, which is to spring for. And this is spring where flowers and fruit are starting to spring forth. And that's why, you know, April is considered the main spring month. But you focus on the details. This is uh, thought to be Giovanni Arnolfini, a rich merchant, and that's his wife. Now, uh, if you look at the painting, he's composed it in such a way that this lady is not looking at the viewer. Whereas Arnolfini is looking, and he too is not really looking at the viewer, he's looking at the people in the front of the portrait. She is looking at him, but unlike a submissive woman who at that time would have been of the lower class, is not looking at the ground, but she's looking fairly at her husband, but also in front of him. And that represents, according to the culture of the times, a certain modesty. If you look at their hands, he is supporting her hand. She's given her hand to him. He is supporting it. And that's a, a gesture that they are equals. He's not holding her hand, but together they are supporting each other and at the same level. You go down, shoes kicked off in a private room as a symbol. This is a private uh, location. And it also is a symbol of fidelity because this is the bedroom which represents the fidelity of the people. And the dog, for all of us who are dog lovers, the dog is a very strong symbol of fidelity. I don't know if Gita is here, but cats are not considered a symbol of fidelity. It's the dog. So he's put in the dog to talk about the fidelity of, you know, the couple to each other. And of course, there's another pair of shoes, which you can hardly see, but it's kicked away to the background. A rich pair of women's shoes and a rich uh, 
carpeting. That's a Persian carpet or an Eastern carpet, I should say, which tells us that these people are very wealthy. So there's a lot of riches in the background. She looks pregnant and there's a lot of debate as to whether this represents a marriage ceremony, a time when she has been told she's pregnant. She's clearly pregnant and he is giving her support and a vow and making an arrangement like a post-nuptial arrangement or whether it just represents because a lot of other paintings show somebody who's similar and these are very long skirts so a woman is supposed to pull it up and hold it in front and makes her look pregnant when she's not really pregnant. But if you look at the right, there's a symbol behind there of St. Margaret sitting on a dragon and St. Margaret is the patron saint of pregnancy and childbirth. So perhaps he's really indicating that she is pregnant. And of course, there are two other symbols there of fertility. Uh, this is the orange there and apples and fruits. As the Bible tells you, you know, he, uh, God says, be fruitful and multiply. So fruits are often used as a symbol of uh, fertility, of uh, richness, and especially these fruits. Oranges had to come all the way from India. Uh, and therefore, they were, they were a very, very expensive fruit. So if you used oranges or you had oranges, it means you were a wealthy person and attesting not only from their clothing, not only from the surroundings, but symbols like this attesting to the uh, richness, the prosperity of the Arnold Finis. Behind, on the rear of the uh, painting, he has a picture of a mirror, a convex mirror. And scientists tell us this is a very good representation of a convex mirror. Whether he was really painting it from life or not, we don't know. Surrounding the mirror are scenes from the life of Christ. And in the mirror, you see two other figures. One of them from the headgear is thought to be Jan van Eyck himself. Not only has he put himself in the picture, which a lot of artists did, in a very small position, attesting to their, uh, you know, their authorship of the painting, as it were, but he's also signed it. He signed it in Latin. Johannes de Eyck uh, has created me or painted me. And he's been put in the year. And that's a very uh, different appearance of four that we are uh, used to. But this is the old way of writing four. It's almost like our Hindi four inverted upside down. So we have a lot of symbols there which tell us uh, that Jan van Eyck is involved. And it's thought that he was a witness to this wedding, which is why he's saying, I was here and put himself actually in the portrait. On either side of the mirror, you have two other symbols. This is a rosary. It's made of, uh, I think it's rock crystal it's identified to be. And on the other side, you have a brush, which the woman uses to clean the place. So telling us that two of the important duties of a woman in that time, and believe me, I'm not supporting this, but this is the ethos of that time, are prayer and work at home. So he's put also what he expects her to be doing there. But there are some more odd symbols and uh, scholars have said that, you know, there are some odd things here. There's a seven branched chandelier. There's a single candle burning there. And this may represent the fact that she attests or the couple attests that they have one God and that's the one candle. But there's also a partially burnt candle in the other side. And when they go back into the history of the Arnold Finneys, one of the things that has emerged is this painting was made in 1434 and uh, Giovanna or Arnold Finney died in 1433. So it looks like this painting was made a year after she died and she probably died in childbirth. So if you look at the symbols that go back, the symbols around the mirror are symbols from the life of Christ. And very oddly, all the symbols on the left are scenes from his life when he was alive. And on the right are scenes when he was dead. So her side are symbols of death. Her, his side, there are symbols of life, attesting that he is still alive. And similarly, you look at the chandelier, the lit candle, which is often a sign of life, is on his side. And the snuffed out candle is on her side, may indicate that she's dead. And the symbols of childbirth that are there are to just say that you know, she died in childbirth. And that's a possibility that we must keep in mind. So symbols are full in this very early painting, 1434. And that tradition has carried on. And you look at this beautiful painting. I was looking at a lot of paintings of the Annunciation. For those who are well-versed with Christian mythology, the Annunciation is when the Archangel Gabriel 
comes to Mary and tells her that God has decided that she will carry God's son, uh, though she's a virgin and that she will remain a virgin. And he's assuring her of that. But the announcement, which is another way of saying annunciation, is what this scene is going to depict. And it is the first time that we know that Jesus Christ is going to be born. So this is a very important moment in Christian thought, Christian mythology. And Mary is a very young person at that age. And they describe various different ways in which, or various different phases through which she goes to identify, you know, to receive this news. And they vary from, you know, uh, surprise. I mean, you suddenly don't expect an angel to come to you and you're an innocent young girl. You don't know what is going to happen. And you're told you are going to become pregnant. And so she reacts in shock. Then she takes time to think. And then she accepts the announcement of her pregnancy and goes to the will of God. So different painters have depicted different ways in which this occurred. And this is the Archangel Gabriel. And one of the things you can see is that he's carrying lilies. And lilies are thought to represent purity. So he's coming to tell her, yes, you're pregnant, but you will still be pure at the end of this. And that is the promise of, uh, of purity and virginity that is maintained. Uh, Catholic thought also has what is called the Immaculate Conception. And in Immaculate Conception, the, the thought is that the Virgin Mary is not only virgin, but she was born without sin. While all other humans after Adam and Eve have been born with original sin, thanks to their uh, you know, breaking the word of God. So this is an assurance of that. Christmas is celebrated on the 25th of December, as we all know. And this is obviously about nine months before that, because Mary had to go through a full human pregnancy, obviously. And it tells us again that spring is coming. So this has more things than one. Man is giving, being given hope, and that's what spring represents. And this spring is shown in all paintings of the Annunciation. This is Fra Angelico, one of the early painters, uh, one of the divine painters, as he's called. Uh, he is showing again flowers in the garden in his version of the Annunciation. But here you have a Mary who's very accepting. The first Mary, Leonardo da Vinci's, was still receiving the news. She was still in shock. Here is a Mary who's accepting. Both of them have their arms crossed, attesting to the will of God. And here you have Raphael. Now, Raphael actually is demonstrating that God is there, God the Father, and that's God the Holy Spirit. And in Catholic thought, the Holy Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, who is now being going to be born in Mary, and God the Holy Spirit, who is in the form of a dove. And again, you can see the angel is carrying uh, lilies to assure her of the same thing. So this thought percolates through. Uh, entire uh, painting uh, traditions in the West. The other way that God is depicted is this is God the Son, and Christ is not only known as uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but he's also known as the Lamb of God. So this is Agnes Dei, or the Lamb of God. And we all know that Christ offered himself up as a sacrifice for the salvation of human beings. So this is the Lamb of God in salvation form, uh, being sacrificed, uh, laid on a rough wooden uh, board, which is thought to be a forerunner of the cross or symbolic of the cross. And he's passively accepted his legs to be tied because he's voluntarily sacrificing his life. And those of you who have read a little deeper into the Harry Potter stories, know how much Harry Potter replicates Christian myth. So the potter is always considered to be God because even in Hindu thought, you use the pot as a symbol of man. And when the pot is broken, life ends. So similarly, Harry Potter is the God. And if you all recollect that scene in the last part in the Deathly Hallows, where he accepts death, he goes across to meet Voldemort, dies and then comes back to life. And you have this scene in, um, in the station, uh, which looks a bit like King's Cross Station, which again is a way station of life. And he has a choice there, whether to come back to life or go on. And uh, uh, Albus Dumbledore, who in some ways represents is, God. Is your slide moving? 
Uh, it's still on that sheep for me. It's I'm still talking about the sheep. Oh, okay, okay. all right. So, okay. So, I'm not sure if everybody them. knows Harry Potter. You've seen the movies okay. or read the books. Okay. So uh, there he has a choice to come back. So God gives him this. God the Father gives God the Son the choice to come back, and he chooses to come back after sacrificing his life, representing the resurrection. So people who read deeper into Harry Potter recognize that there's more to Harry Potter than just a children's story. Apart from the main gods, you also have representations of the saints. And on the left, you have a uh, painting of St. Peter and Christ is giving Peter, he knows he's going to die. So he's giving Peter the keys and says, for you, I'm giving the keys to heaven, which is why Peter is always represented with keys uh, at the door of heaven. And he chooses to let you in or not, depending on how you've been in this life. So the keys in any form, if you see a old man carrying keys that represents Peter. The other representation of Peter is Peter was crucified upside down unlike Christ. We don't know why quite this is, but this is showing him being crucified upside down. Uh, beautiful uh, Kairaskiro painting by Lionel Espada. And you can see that when you see a cross upside down, it's thought to represent Satan wrongly. It's actually a representation of St. Peter. One of the other apostles is St. Thomas, who came to India, who died here. And St. Thomas is also known as Doubting Thomas. So it's all, he's always shown with two fingers penetrating the side of Christ because he said, I'm not going to be convinced that this is uh, Jesus Christ's return to life. I need to feel, my, feel it myself. I need to put my fingers in his side where the spear pierced him. So this is Doubting Thomas. There are other saints also, lesser known to us. And these have you know, gone into popular culture also. So this is Saint Veronica and what Veronica did was when Christ was on his last uh, journey struggling up on what is called the Via Dolorosa, Dolorosa the path of suffering, carrying the uh, cross and with the crown of thorns on his head bleeding, being whipped by the soldiers and by the crowd, you know, suffering there and he collapsed at one point and he was sweating and bleeding. She wiped his face with her uh, veil and that is her veil and she's holding up because his face has miraculously appeared on the veil this is different from the shroud of turin this is veronica's veil so veronica is always depicted with the veil showing christ's face on it and this has moved into popular culture in spain where when the uh, matador or the fighter bullfighter almost brushes the face of the bull the charging bull he stands there, invites it to come close to him and brushes its face with, with his cape. That's called a Veronica move. Okay, so that is uh, Saint Veronica entering popular culture. Saint Sebastian, of course, was killed by being shot with arrows. So Andre, Andrea Mantegna has portrayed this beautiful picture of him in his sacrifice being pierced by arrows. And arrows, a person being pierced with arrows is often taken and Sebastian is taken as a symbol of a martyr who's shot with arrows. Oscar Wilde, in his poem, The Ballad of Reading Jail, refers to this, but also after he was released, took the name of Sebastian Melmoth. The Melmoth came from a book written by an uncle of his, Charles Mathurin, uh, called Melmoth the Wanderer, because after he was released, he couldn't stay in England. So he was, uh, or even in anywhere in the British Isles, and he went all around wandering. But in addition to that, he felt he was being crucified, sorry, he was being martyred like St. Sebastian, shot full of arrows. And very appropriately, the prison uniform in Reading Jail, where he was imprisoned, is a series of arrows on the clothing. So that made him give himself the name Sebastian Melmoth. Uh, often symbols of their martyrdom are shown. And so the average person who knows the stories but cannot read can recognize these saints. So this is Saint Stephen, who was martyred by being stoned to death. And you can see his picture has stones on his shoulders, on his head. And the palm leaf that he carries are a sign of his martyrdom. Because what Christ did was on Palm Sunday, just before he was martyred, came back. This is the week before uh, Good Friday, when he was actually crucified. He was uh, picked up a palm and people cast palms around the roads to soften his journey into town. So that's why it's called Palm Sunday. And a palm is often considered a sign of a martyr. 
So if a person is carrying a, a palm leaf, he's often considered a martyr. So the martyr, sign of martyrdom, as well as the stones tell us that this is St. Stephen. But it also enters into uh, secular life. And this is the uh, coat of arms of Tower Hamlets. And they have a lot of things telling you, symbols telling you what Tower Hamlets is famous for. Of course, it's famous for the Tower of London that's right on top. Uh, and the tower is where a lot of ships would pass through. There's still a lot of boats, if you know, pass through, which is why Tower Bridge has the bascule bridge, where you can raise the two, uh, side, two parts of the bridge, allowing taller ships to pass through. And those anchors are a symbol of that. You come down a little further, and that is the uh, seahorse, again, attesting to the uh, maritime traditions of the Tower Hamlets area. And within the Thames River, you have what is called the Isle of Dogs, very close to the Tower Hamlets region. And that is the dog which symbolizes the Tower of, uh, sorry, the Isle of Dogs. Again, the ship on the river, but on the other side, on top of it, you have within the coat of arms, uh, these are a pair of tongs, uh, which refer to St. Dunstan, who had a, a smithy, and he was actually a very good jeweler, and apart from being a saint and a very prominent archbishop who was virtually the prime minister of England at that time, he was also a smith, and story goes when he was very young, the devil came to tempt him, and he picked up these red hot tongs and pinched the devil's nose. So Saint Dunstan is always associated with a pair of tongs. But one of the other major industries in the Tower region is silk and silk weaving. So you have a mulberry bush there, which we all know is associated with silk. Even in Karnataka, we have the mulberry tradition. The mulberry leaves are used to feed the silk worms. And that is the weaver's shuttle that is used. So this whole thing tells you what Tower Hamlets is famous for. So these symbols are understood by the people of that time and have largely been lo lost now. The other very important thing that uh, artists often used and in fact, the common people often used is the language of flowers. So each of these flowers represented something. For example, the gladiolus, and the gladiolus gets its name from the sword, gladia or gladii, which is the sword, also known in Spanish as the espada, from which we get the name of the uh, suit in a suit of cards. The spades comes from the appearance to a, a sword. So the gladiolus represents strength of character. You hold a strong sword and so on. And if you go into Shakespeare, Shakespeare often refers to flowers in his plays. And one of the most important flower episodes is in Ophelia. Ophelia is thought to have got mad and she goes around uh, the court uh, of King Claudius distributing flowers to different people. And she says various things there. Okay, and these flowers are represented in this painting by John Everett Millet, one of my favorite paintings. And all these flowers that are floating around with her and on the side, on the banks, represent flowers that actually appear in Shakespeare, except for one, and that's the poppy which Shakespeare does not refer to. What are the flowers that she talks about? She talks about rosemary, and she specifically says to her brother Laertes, this is rosemary for remembrance. And that's an indicator that she's gonna die, but she wants him to remember her. And in fact, Agatha Christie uses this line in one of her plays, rosemary for remembrance. And there are others, fennel for flattery, which he gives to the king and says, you're being flattered by people who are not going to be faithful to you. And of course, faithlessness is both the rue as well as it's connected with abortions because it was used for abortions and connected, uh, connected with adultery, which is what an adulterous woman would do when she became pregnant. Uh, whereas columbine is, uh, sorry, fennel and columbine are for male adultery. And if you remember your Hamlet, Claudius was being adulterous with, Ham, uh, with Hamlet's mother, Gertrude. And so she gives Gertrude rue for female uh, adultery and Columbine for male adultery. The daisy is for innocence and she doesn't give it to anybody. She picks it up, looks around and doesn't give it to anybody because she believes this court is not innocent anymore. And you remember the opening lines, it says there is something rotten in the state of Denmark telling you that the Danish court is not innocent any longer. And the violets, and she says they're all withered because her fa father died, and violets are a symbol for faithfulness, 
and faith has withered in this uh, court of uh, King Claudius. But interestingly, the poppy, which is a very English flower, has been put in there. But the poppy is also used as a symbol of death. And that is why we have Poppy Day, uh, which is used to symbolize, you know, the end of the Second World War and recall all the people who died. Of course, it is also because the fields at Flanders where a lot of English soldiers died. I should say Allied soldiers died because there were a lot of Indians who died there too. Uh, the poppy symbolizes death and that is why she, uh, the poppy is included in this bouquet of flowers that uh, Ophelia carries in Millet's painting, though not in um, Shakespeare's talk. So I'll end with some symbols for gratitude. That is the symbol, Buddhist symbol for gratitude. That is the flower which we all recognize, the hydrangea, which is considered also a symbol for gratitude, the symbol for flowers. And of course, our usual namaste in a very stylized form, which is our symbol for gratitude. Thank you all very much for listening. Wow, that was beautiful. Brilliant. They really learned something there. Amazing content. So, yeah, fantastic. Right. You can call it that magisterial. <laughs> magisterial. Magisterial, yeah. yes. Magisterial. Magisterial. Oh, okay. Very nice. Good word. Very nice. Very so, one more Very thing good. about Van Eyck's paintings. Yeah. I, and um, whenever uh, we see those, you can get a faint resemblance with Putin. Vladimir. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so whenever I mean, that's that's the easiest way to recognize his work from the other. It's really stupid, but yeah. No, absolutely right. I hadn't thought of it before. You're absolutely. Right. <laughs> you know, Doctor Mohan. Yes, sir. Doctor Mohan, uh, you must be aware of this. There is a school in Osur, uh, which I visited one day a couple of years ago. Okay. On the corridors of that school. You got various paintings. You got Vincent Van Gogh. You got Rembrandt. You got many paintings. There are perhaps about fifty odd paintings. Okay. Under each painting, there is a description of what that painting means. Ah, okay. They are trying. They are trying to use paintings to, uh, uh, you know, make children aware of uh, variety of things. I thought it is a very unique way of, uh, you know, creating interest in uh, paintings and art to the students. This school is run by a company called Ashok Raven from Chennai. Ah, okay, okay. I, should I, that I do quite a lot of consultations for the Ashok Leyland and people, so it would be lovely if I could visit them. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I will, uh, I will send you the link, I mean, the contact details of this person whom I met there, who took okay, me sir. It's a. It's the first time I have seen in a school. Then I, then I met the creator of that who lives in Bangalore. His name is Balachandran. Okay. And I forget the name of the organization. I sent him to Jamshedpur to take a lecture on, uh, you know, leadership through art. Ah, okay. Yeah, I will send you the details. It's, it's a so. great I'd love to go. Yeah, yeah. Can I also request you to do another session on the later painters like uh, Carlo and all? Uh, I mean, the, her contemporaries did a lot of work on symbolism. Yes. So, so I actually maybe. thought I wanted to do a, a session on surrealism in both art and poetry. Oh yes, so that that's needed. <laughs> that's 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 needed. Yeah. So yeah, so maybe sometime in the future, definitely. Yes. Okay. Maybe during Halloween time. <laughs> <laughs> so have you been working on this for a long time? Is uh, this something uh, that you've sort of researched over a long time? Passions. Art's been one of my passions, so I always, you know, I've, yes, I have been reading. So Jay and I have collected a lot of books on painting and art. So yeah, it's been. A can can I share a painting which is there in the Met? It's a Annunciation. Would you like to see it? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, just uh, one second. I just wait for that. But really yeah. wonderful, Doctor. I, being a Christian myself, I I knew about the saints, but I didn't know the paintings associated with many of this. This is Luca Giordano's Annunciation. Same thing. Yeah. And uh, in this, the Virgin Mary's face was so lifelike. This was, this I just picked it off from Facebook. It wanted to tag Virgin Mary. <laughs> oh, lovely. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I wasn't aware of this, uh, this, uh, this uh, theme of Annunciation. You know, there are so many paintings. Obviously, Da Vinci's was the best and the most famous. 
but uh, that has been you know taken on by many other painters earlier and later yeah it's it's the biggest it's the biggest mystery in christianity you now how can a virgin give birth to a child but the virgin is given birth to god so that's the mystery in christianity of the of the 15 mysteries that are there this is the biggest and just a small addition for everybody's knowledge peter was crucified upside down because peter wanted it that way since he said i'm not equal to my master since christ was crucified straight he said i should be crucified if i'm crucified upside down there's also some story about christ actually prophesying that he would be crucified upside down uh oh is that so know, the last time they met peter said you know peter was told you will deny me thrice which is also depicted by the way in other things with the rooster yeah. by the time the rooster crows three times you did denied me three times so there also is apparently some time where he predicted you will be crucified and upside down and peter said something about not going in to heaven willingly so he's crucified upside down so he'll be carried into heaven feet first rather than head first <laughs> So thank you all very much. I think it's talking of feet first. You know what? There's thank one. Uh, it reminds me of how we take our patients into the operating room and bring them out. So my <laughs> professor used to tell you know he used to scold us if we ever uh, take the patient out of the OT with the feet out first. You know, <laughs> turn them around. Then, you know? <laughs> so head has to go out first. Actually, uh, we uh, we always. Uh, I think we all our patients go out <laughs> feet first from the theater. Oh, my, but, my boss would yeah. <laughs> But but no, but listen to this. We insist that it's rolled in head first into the theater. Going okay. in for surgery, uh -huh. they should not be going in feet first. And we do all sorts of jugglery <laughs> to make sure that <laughs> you know, and it's especially if we like if we have uh, uh, Mr. knows about it. If there is an ECMO and all there are multiple equipment. So it is actually simpler to just go in the same way that's coming from the IC, which is feet first. No, 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 no. Three <laughs> point turn, U turn, move other things, and make sure they go in head first. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. That was brilliant. Thank you. So Thanks. we'll uh, move on to Alifia's uh, presentation. Yes. So over to you, Alifia. You can share your screen. I think now. Yes, I'll do that in a bit. First of all, yeah. Good evening, everyone, and. Uh, uh, Dr. Murray, this is a very hard act to follow. <laughs> you did such an amazing job. It was just so much for me to learn and absorb. Think what you created yourself, I think, you know, I, we are just waiting for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's absolutely my pleasure to be amongst all of you lovely arborites today. And uh, this is my very first meeting, uh, attending and presenting. So I'm not really sure of how it goes. Uh, please do let me know if uh, I do slip up somewhere. So uh, before I start off my topic for today, I just want to take this opportunity to share my experience at Arbor's. So it's funny when dreams come true, especially when you never did imagine it. When something falls in your lap without you conspiring or even trying. Although I don't know if it's more of seizing life by the horns and just taking the plunge. How many times have we passed on a pipe dream thinking it's too impractical or just too hard or too crazy? But it's the crazy stuff that makes sense sometimes, doesn't it? Moving into this house is just something else. The vaulted ceilings, the teakwood furniture, the glass glazed double doors, the skylight, the walk-in wardrobes, the wood flooring, the multiple terraces, the jacuzzi, a backyard and a manicure to perfection front yard. To top that, the warm and welcoming neighbors with cups of hot chai and palms full of fruits, from cherry tomatoes to papayas to cuttings of flowers. We seem to be abundantly blessed with fauna too. From a little purple rump sunbird taking a nose dive on our terrace last weekend to monkeys who feel just as home as us, sitting and enjoying a banana at the dining table. <laughs> Why just today we realized that Villa 41 is also home to a wee little wolf snake. Just one month at Arbor's and we wonder how we ever lived in any other way. The lovely sense of community that simply just makes our day. Just filled with so much gratitude that we can experience this awesomeness and incredibly in awe of how fast life can change if only we welcome it. So with that, I would now uh, move on. First of all, I want to thank you all for giving me this opportunity. And Beautiful like beginning. Just. <laughs> Huh. 
Now, Alifia, we need to put this in the Arbus brochure. Yeah, you should. You should put it in the Arbus group. You should tape it, and maybe in the Instagram that uh, Mr. Prasad does. I can't. Very really good. Using up a free advertisement. Exactly. Just one second. I don't think anybody else has written a poem of this sort uh, on our bus. Poem on our bus. No, this is the first. <laughs> and a lovely beginning too. First yeah. poem on our bus. I was the one writing prose. So now I'm going to wipe my hands off and direct Prasad's attentions to Alifia. <laughs> <laughs> can you uh, see my screen? I hope you can see my yes, screen. Yes, yes, we can. Right. So today I'm just going to talk about Sudpur, which is a slice of Europe in Gujarat. So this is not so much of art, but more about architecture, since that's more, uh, you know, where my interests lie. I'm into interior design and things like that. So uh, this is an article that was actually published, written and published uh, in the Explore Rural India uh, sometime last year. So just reading uh, it out and explaining what Sidpur is about for all of you all. So Sidpur of late has caught the fancy of many mainly for its mystical quality of a town stuck in time. Discovering Sudpur is like uncovering the lost island of Atlantis, an entire community along with its inhabitants, pres preserved along with its grandeur like an aging, wrinkled queen. You know what the speciality of this place is? This place lies in the immense cooperation shown by the Daudi Boras while building Sidpur to what it was in its heydays. When you enter this quaint town, you're first greeted by the looks of any other town in India, you know, dusty and musty. But when you arrive near the railway station, the whole horizon is taken over by rows upon rows of houses built on the lines of neo-Renaissance architecture. It is as if you were transported to a village in Europe. So the interesting bit is, this was not built by a housing project like you see nowadays. Neither was this built by the British era during the reign in the India, but it was built identically by separate owners who had the vision and foresight of knowing that when you stick together, you are indeed stronger. So this also goes a long way in showing the strong bonds between the families in the community. This is not a stray palace built by royalty, but rather the painstaking work of an entire community to weave their families and homes like a luxurious tapestry. So just to take you through a snapshot of where Sidpur is, it's in Gujarat and it's in the Patan district. It's around two hours by road from Ahmedabad. So the history of Sidpur dates back to the 10th century. Sidpur was at its zenith of fame and glory under the Solanki rulers. The ruler Sidra Jai Singh built his capital here, thus the name Sidpur. But you know, nature has a strange way of bringing change. In the early 1900s, there was a famine that took place in Gujarat. And because of the guidance of the Sayyidna, the ruler of the Boras, he advised the Boras to actually go and venture outside and take business outside uh, Sidpur itself. So the Boras, the entrepreneurial lot that they were, they moved all over India for trading opportunities. And they also traveled abroad to places like Aden, Rangoon, and Addis Ababa, where they made their fortunes. So, the Dawati Boras of Sudpur in the 1900s, in the rule of the Gekwad, had spectacular wealth, actually. They amassed spectacular amounts of wealth, and they had a heart just as big. It wasn't about just making the money and spending it there, but actually bringing it all back to India and building these beautiful mansions, which you see in front of you. So they are just row houses in delicate artistic fusion of the French and Italian architecture, high Renaissance, architecture characterized by geometric designs with multiple windows and row houses split in three levels with a cool basement to combat the desert heat. So each home, if you see, it actually, this is some of the uh, uh, photos of what is actually there in Sidpur itself. These are mansions which are there of the Bori. So this particular one is one with 365 windows. I'd like to call it one window for every day of the year. So each house greets you with a lot of elaborate pl plaster work and it has the insignia of the family also. And you see an otla or patio of sorts, which serves best for spending the long languid days and desert evenings socializing with neighbors after the day's work is done. 
So many of these homes are actually shared by joint families where the family took, each family took one level in the house. The basements are actually cool and dark. If you see on the picture on the right, the base, there is a basement level where you can go down and then there's a mid level and then there are top levels which you can see on the pictures on the left. So obviously the basements were always the ones which are favored because Sitpur has a very desert-like temperatures. It was very, very hot. So summers always, you know, you wanted me to be the one, the, uh, the family that lived in the basement because it was cool always and you could escape the heat. So the upper level actually housed the central kitchen and the living area followed by rooms on the levels above it. So once you actually entered the homes, this is actually a photo studio before we move on to the interiors. This is actually a photo studio now, which is converted, but just look at the amazing architecture of the building. It looks absolutely like a palace. And this is just there with nobody coming to watch it and see how beautiful the architecture is. So yeah, I couldn't resist sharing another picture. It's actually my favorite building there. So this is the interiors um, of the, you know, the homes in Sidpur. So what you saw outside the exteriors and the interiors actually match up. The interiors are just as ornately done as the exterior, exteriors itself. So they're generously cladded in teak wood and intricately done in every nook and corner. So there are ornate inbuilt cupboards and hand painted glass in the center with scenes of nature and they're part of every home. So partitions are made uh, out of carved wood with glass to let in the light. And these are common details which are just there in almost every house. So design aspect is made, is matched in actually every house. Each house actually has um, smaller details which are, uh, you know, select to their own houses. But if you look at the overall architecture of the entire place, whether it's outside or inside, there's such a continuity maintained in the kind of craftsmanship and the kind of work that is done. It's quite incredible to realize that each person separately built these houses rather than it being you know collectively done by somebody and then put people moving in mm -hmm. so if you look at everything like from the small to the big furniture whether it's the cupboards or the bed or the benches which are there or you know the side tables the consoles each and every detail that is there is just beautifully done it's like artwork literally which is there you know and all this is there for you know still preserved intact by the goras of uh, Sidpur. Mm -hmm. So um, as a community, actually, the Boras built schools and colleges and even a Nagar Palika uh, tower. There's a clock tower, which is built called the Mamadali Tower, and it benefited all the communities living in peace and harmony. They built everything in the same flair and the passion that they had for their own homes. So they were great philanthropists and very secular and had an immense love for the motherland, India. So these virtues were imbibed by the religious leaders of the time who preached, and even now, of course, preach international peace, love, and harmony. They're generous patrons of art and architecture and spared no expense and invested their wealth in making these majestic homes that you see in these pictures. So this is also some of the interiors of the places that are there. And if you see the, the family crest and the insignias which are there outside the homes welcoming you in. This is our home in Gujarat, in Sitpur, which is you know, the interiors again, beautifully done. But as time goes by, time and tide actually stops for no one. And unfortunately, urbanization has taken its toll on Sitpur. The later generations which have, you know, come on, uh, they have moved to cities for better education and for economic opportunity, obviously, leaving Sitpur to fend for itself against the vagaries of time. So decay has taken over and lack of maintenance crippled these once grand structures. So the tough task of preserving the past for the future becomes a task to contend with. So today, a walk through this dusty town will take you through a string of commercial establishments housed unceremoniously in the ground floor of these beautiful homes. Some of these crumbling structures have taken the ax and have been raised to the ground, giving rise to ugly buildings all in the name of modernization. Soon, if we are not careful, all this beauty from the past will be swallowed up with cheap construction. So my uncle and I, and of course my family who are native to Sitpur, um, but my uncle and I are mainly trying to attempt to capture these historical legends with you know, my second book, which hopefully should come soon, with you know, stories of how each one of these houses, what was the history behind it, the people who lived there, and how it talks about life and aging and the richness of a bygone era and of surfeit and of survival. So the Dawoodi Boras of the present generation are trying their efforts in actually preserving, maintaining, and restoring the heritage of 
you know, these homes and renew its lost grandeur. So with this motive in mind, the small but passionate team of Save Sitpur Heritage, this is actually the concern that my uncle and I have started along with other people. We have organized a number of events involving the press and government agencies. Of course, a lot of work needs to be done before we can stop the mindless destruction of these beautiful structures. With each passing day, there are more and more heritage homes of Sitpur being pulled down and the sad fact is it needs to be more proactive, proactive so that we can preserve this beautiful heritage. So as of now, we are looking for uh, contacts with conservationists who can collaborate with us and you know, um, help us submit the required documents to the government and make this dream come true. So together, let's protect our heritage. That's all I have to share for today. So um, thank you very much for listening. Wonderful. Thank you, Alipia. Very nice, very nice. Wonderful, very nice. Thank you for introducing very us to this uh, little town. <laughs> very interesting. And, uh, yeah, as as usual, I'm. Uh, I mean, in India, none of us seem to care about these old things. No, it's very yeah. rare that uh, there are towns which, in spite of having so much beauty, they're able to maintain it because the yeah. the government never seems to think about this. Yeah, the thing is that it has to be over a hundred years old and all of these houses mm. are done in the 1920s. So it's just shy of a hundred years old for, for oh, it to okay. be declared as heritage, you know, uh, and, the uh, uh, we can't wait for the 20 years, yeah. for the 20 years it'll all be gone. So And I guess it's too <laughs> it's expensive, kind of, right? It must be very difficult and yeah. uh, expensive to maintain and... So absolutely, proper. absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah. modern, ancient plumbing very doesn't, is uh, not very, uh, you know, conducive to how modern ways of life are. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. but of course, it's uh, always something that uh, it, it is our culture. It is something incredible that was made and it deserves to be protected. So, um, yeah. So this is actually the topic of uh, the second book that is coming up. I've also written another book on interiors called Soul Spaces which is about more with this time uh, that we have, but that's a topic for another day. So, yeah. So hopefully this book also which should see the light of day soon sometime. I'm going to... One question. You, yeah. you had... Sorry. One, you had shared some metallic craft, uh, pictures of the metallic craft sometime yes. back. Yeah. Some metallic artwork. Yes. Is this a... Is that also got to do with the legacy of Boras and Sitpur? Uh, no, no, no. That's completely contemporary, completely modern. You know, that's uh, that's actually my effort on trying to do something with sustainability. So actually the first range that we came up with, uh, you know, doing uh, metal art was completely made out of scrap. Um, you know, that was just found lying around and somehow I just saw art in it instead of scrap. So that's how it kind of started. And, you know, of course, uh, time went on and... Uh, uh, when you you know uh, of course now we do much bigger projects so i don't get uh, as much time to you know sit and fiddle around with scrap but that's how basically the whole uh, thing started of uh, you know me doing metal art brings back happy memories of visiting sitpur almost uh, 30 years ago when oh, i was posted wow. uh, but you know it was really you know the city suddenly kind of the town hits you huh, because yes, yeah. you have a dusty ride and you suddenly find these buildings Correct. And, uh, and it really is it's quite amazing. And I do recall that when I was in, in Egypt, uh, I was interacting with the Bori community there, which is very, very uh, extremely forward, very, very prosperous. And one of the largest boss in Cairo right. uh, has, in fact, been sponsored by the Bori community. So it's a, and I believe that uh, His Holiness, the Sayyidna's home in Cairo, is one of the most beautiful homes. Uh, yeah. In the country. Yes, yes. Yes. So you you said you went to Sitpur about thirty years uh, ago. So yeah. You, you said you went to Sitpur about thirty years ago. Yeah, thirty years ago. I was posted in in Ahmedabad, and I remember uh -huh. having uh, driven down to to Sitpur because we had uh, we had I had some business associates there. And uh, uh, I recall that you know uh, the other the other town which which also had a, a strong representation was Bhavnagar. Bhavnagar also used to have a lot of uh, of, of, of people from the community, and uh, yeah. it was interesting to see. And in fact, in in, in Cairo, I think uh, the Boris were the only community to have their own hotel. 
Yeah. They, have their, they have their own hotel. So during the uh, the Arab Spring, uh, people were coming from India. The Bori community is very active. In fact, uh, one of the Monjini brothers is based there. Uh, either is Karakiwala, yes. who's a, yes, a good friend. Yes. So Isubai and I, we, we know each other for many years. So okay. he invited me once to come and talk to the Bori community, the young Bori community. And there's a community center and there's a beautiful hotel in mm -hmm. the center of Cairo, which is exclusively for uh, the Bori travelers. So mm -hmm. you know, anybody who yeah. comes, comes there. Yes, 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 that's right. I think you better stay yeah. So all the Boris all over the world can just go there and stay and f lodging and boarding and everything is, yes. uh, you know, provided. I, I'm, I'm, it's I'm, not only I don't know if it's, yeah, I, I don't know if it's still true, but I, I'm told that uh, even now, the some of the, the Bori community who can't uh, afford uh, the meal will be provided free meals by the, by His Holiness's uh, yes. uh, group. Yes. You know, so they get yes, they, free, yeah. free meals a day. Provided yes. free. Yeah. Even today, it is. It, it happens, and everybody gets a meal. You know, all those who can't afford, or so. And actually, the whole community as a whole, they are the ones who work towards it. In every city, every town, every village, this community center, this kitchen goes on, and everybody yeah. is provided a, a meal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a great community. I mean, outstanding, outstanding Thank work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. And we'd thank love to thank you. It's, it's an eye opener. I mean, there's so many things that you spoke about just now, including the architecture, this town of Sydney, uh, all this about the community. I mean, for me, it was quite the eye opener. So it's useful. Even at this age, you learn something so totally new. You know, Hema, it's a very quiet community. You know, uh, the Boris never bring attention to themselves. Yeah. But they are very quietly and very steadily carried on their work. You know, it's not a in your face community no it's it's like not yeah. like i have lived in a hole that i i mean most other communities you've at least heard of uh, because i mean i lived in bombay all my life i'm pretty mm. decently well known but uh, i'm so surprised that i've not i was just uh, checking it up i was googling the community right now. no but bombay has got the largest number of boras living over there bombay incidentally has got the largest number of the Boras living. No, I always say Bombay, even though I say that I grew up in Bombay, it was a very sheltered Bombay, you know, uh, in and around the IIT Powai campus. My mother used to not let me get on the local train. Muthu so. <laughs> 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 sir, why, why doesn't some of these corporates take over our heritage structures? They should yeah, get into this. Structures. You know, in even the SFX uh, church, I think in Goa, uh, they have just painted it pink. They, there's this beautiful mural painting on the church walls and they have painted over it in pink. By who? Archaeological Survey of India. Like official people have just painted it pink. It is just sad to see. Actually, Shibu, now that you're mentioning it, I can tell you quite a, a few corporates in India are involved in art and architecture. For example, I'm sure you know this, there is a big museum coming up in Bangalore. Uh, very near uh, Kavan mm. Park, probably the largest and the best museum, the most modern museum of India. Many corporates of India, including the Tata Trusts, are involved in that and it should get open in the next two years. If they work already on. Is it a new one or the same present one is going to be refurbished? That uh, no, Museum no. of Art or something is was supposed to be taken over by Biocon and then there was this big uh, hue and cry about it, right? The no, no. Gallery. no, no. No, no, the present one belongs to the government, which is that road, what is called, that road called Kasturba Road, I think. Yes. That Kasturba. is the one Venkatapa Art Gallery, no? Correct. There is so no that, space for that, another one there. A proposal was made by somebody to renovate that gallery, renovate that museum, but the government, because of political reason, accepted. So this guy has gone around collecting money. It's going to cost around 350, 400 crores, but it's a beautiful museum. Uh, in fact, I uh, showed this uh, brochure to Alifia a couple of days back. Museums are all good, sir. But uh, what about the existing structures which are come crumbling? You know, where they are, where nobody they are. is taking care of them. That's what, uh, what think, For example, this proposal, which uh, the, somebody gave it to the government of Karnataka was such a good proposal. But politics intervened. They said, we will go on the lowest bid and we will, you know, 
make a <laughs> sort of tender out of it and all that thing and died. So that guy got fed up. He said, uh, the government is not listening, so let me create my own museum. And the museum is getting created. A very large number of corporates of India are involved in that. It's a, when you said this about the lowest bid, I just remembered this joke about some guy who was sitting in the space shuttle and about to be launched off into <laughs> orbit, saying, do you know that the lowest bidder is the one who got the tender to build the space shuttle? Yeah. <laughs> Sing it again. That was Neil Armstrong who said, <laughs> but excellent Alifia, wonderful. Thanks, yeah. Thank, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, I enjoyed the uh, place, of course, but equally the photographs and the commentary that went with it. Brilliant. Thank you. That house of yours in Sidpur, is it still there? Yes, yes you're most welcome, welcome to come. We would love if you all could come and visit us there. Some of us, some, some of us when we travel, we can go and stay there. Yes. <laughs> it's like we have two such houses over there, two havelis, you know, and it's just lying vacant, but we make sure that we maintain and we take care of it because we are very passionate about it and uh, it's like still well maintained. Okay, thank you for the offer. I think we shall take it up. Go to Sidpur and check out the <laughs> To the panel. Okay. Yeah. Any more comments? If not, uh, I think we'll let uh, Murli sir continue with his IPL. <laughs> Murli sir, fantastic. It was, uh, yeah, your talk was totally out of the uh, Inaugural his, matches his about to get going. Playing. His team oh. is not playing today. What is your team? His, his team. Oh, his team is Bangalore. Yeah, my team is RCB, sir. Oh, <laughs> my team on, is not come playing. On, come on. Murli sir, you, you shouldn't be so parochial. I mean, you know. Think out of the city. Think out of the box. <laughs> Come on. You have to support your team. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. I'm CSK <laughs> sitting in Bangalore. <laughs> if I can bother to watch it. I don't watch IPL these days. But uh, for the rest of the audience, I'd, let me just uh, tell you one thing about uh, Dr. Murli Mohan. Murli sir. He, uh, I first met him uh, uh, because we went for one of his uh, juniors pulled me along and we went for a quiz competition in St. Martha's Hospital. That's when I first saw him. And rat -a -tat -a -tat, the answers used to come, you know, all sorts of GK questions. And I was wondering, who is this guy? Is he a doctor or, you know, quiz master? So his uh, interests are very wide and varied. And in all those wide and varied subjects, it's, the, it's quite in-depth. So that is the thing. Yeah, it was absolutely Recently? like going to school, I think, art appreciation school, listening to him. Yeah. It was amazing. Any, any quizzes, uh, trophies recently, sir? No, no, I've largely given up attending quizzes. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you for those lovely Bye. presentations. Good night. Thank you for the lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.